one day conference. During the course of the last nine months that we in the OU have been working on this conference, we have heard of various communities. One was in Germany, the other in Munkac, that once a year would chef and eat a bird they had a Masora on to preserve that particular Masora. Rabbi Dr. Ari Zubatovsky and Dr. Ari Greenspan are to be highly commended during the past 20 years for attempting to preserve existing Masoras on kosher birds and animals from becoming extinct, not only on a community basis, but on a global basis. They sent the OU, for example, a video of three shochtim from Algeria and France who shafted guinea fowl. In this regard, I told Ari Greenspan that today's conference is a much greater challenge than the similar conference at Halachic Suda he and Ari Zivotovsky did in Yerushalayim Irakaydish approximately two years ago. For today's conference in Suda, are being done in conjunction with the OU. And if the agenda of the two Aries is to preserve Mesoros from becoming extinct, it is the OU's agenda as the premier global kashrus agency to be responsible for safeguarding the Mesora of kashrus worldwide. And I believe that there is therefore an inherent tension between these two agendas. For example, Rabelsky Shlita, who Hashem, will be here later in the program, has written the following. This follows a, uh, a written uh, document, an OU document written by Rav David Kohn, who we'll hear from in a few minutes. He writes, after a whole long discussion, a halachic discussion, he writes as follows. First, Rav David Kohn. Due to the issues noted above, and you can find this on page 5 of the source book, Second the paragraph, due to the issues noted above, the OU will not certify birds as kosher based on the testimony of individuals that those birds are or were eaten in their communities. Rather, the OU will only certify those birds that have been eaten as kosher in the United States for generations. To which Rav Belsky adds, the assault and maskim now, the Khena Khaznupal, I agree to everything that was written be before. And that's how we are now here in the OU. Ulam can move and it's understood. But I find in both of them in certain isolated incidents, you talking the host of our Shimas Haminan on the Hagen Paul, Achre Biru Yisodi Wishlo Kolt Sad Shiro Mesopic, the Achre Il Orachumas, after a lengthy domestic beach, and there's absolutely not one single Shiro that this bird is one of the Eifers to Iris. Then we could be moderate. Or Bovad after Shakla Vatari and Polskim, the Gufam Kubalam al Ravisral. And also dependent on the fact that we have to investigate that this is a Mesora that is acceptable on most of Kal Yisrael. So, to the extent that we will be able today to lessen the inherent tension between preserving individual Mesoras which are on the way to extinction on the one hand, and preserving the integrity of the Kashrus of Klal Yisrael. On the other hand, this is today's great challenge, in my own personal opinion. And if we accomplish it, it will be one of today's great successes. May we be Zoha to the last sentence of Rabbi Ganak's letter, which you could find at the beginning of the source book, which was written as an introduction to this source book, and he wrote it on Arab Shabbos Kodesh Parsha Shemini, and I quote, may we merit that Hashem bless our efforts to preserve the true Messiah of kosher birds and animals in Klal Yisrael, heir of Shabbos Kodesh, to the last Pasuk of Parsha Shmini, L'Seder, L'Havdel, U'Bein Achaya HaNacheles, U'Bein Achaya HaShaloyse, Achel Shnas, Tav Shin, Samach Dalet, signed Rabbi Menachem Gnek. At this time, I would like to call a little change in our program, uh, I'd like to call on uh, Rabbi David Kohn, who is the Safra the Dina of the, the Besden at the OU, which is comprised of Rabbi Kanak and Rabbi Hersha Shachter and Rabbi Yisrael Belsky. And he will be speaking on the um, 
how o OU policy is established, and he will be focusing specifically on the kashras of Turkey, which, by the way, is one of the box lunch sandwiches if you've ordered in advance. Actually, somebody asked me over Shabbos if that's what I ordered for lunch. <laughs> in fact, I did. Okay, I'm, good morning. Um, I'm going to speak a, a, for a couple of minutes about how it is, how it came to be that Turkey is accepted as a kosher bird. Um, before I begin, I have to thank Rabbi Zinatowski, who's sitting here, for his encompassing and completely comprehensive article on that topic, on the topic of Turkey, and also to Dr. Zohar Amar, who wrote something in, a, in his book, in Hebrew, uh, uh, continued on the, on the topic of Turkey. Much of what I'm going to speak is based on what they, on their research, and Rabbi Zivotovsky's article on Turkey is, in fact, in the handbook. As an introduction to the question, the Torah lists 24 birds that are not kosher by name without any way of telling us how to identify those 24 birds. Chazal in the Gemara told us that there are four simonim for a kosher bird, of, wh of which one of them is most important, and that is that it's the animal should not be a dirus, which is loosely translated as being a predator. And a bird, if a bird is a dirus, it's a symbol that it's not kosher. And that's the, of the reasons, that's the most important of the reasons to prove whether the bird is kosher or not. According to the Kamara, a person could either eat birds, either because they had a kabbalah, they had a maserah, that this bird is in fact kosher, it's not one of those 24 birds, or they could eat it because they would check the simonim. If they checked the different simonim for the bird, they would know it's, not, it's a kosher bird. In that regard, if we looked at a turkey, a turkey has the simonim that the Gemara describes, the three simple simonim are in fact there, a side simon of that, what the, the shape of its egg is, is also there, and as far as it being the dervis, we have it appears to not be a dervis. But that last point, that it appears to not be a dervis, is in fact the discussion of the Gemara. The Gemara says that a bird called the Tarnagot, the Agma, and this bird, for years, was assumed to be kosher, it was assumed to not be a dervis, but then, after time, they discovered that in fact it was a dervis. So of course, this shook people up to see that this bird that they had always assumed was kosher was a fact of terrorist. And they, as a result, Rashi brings that over there, it's an issue that later, that we don't eat a bird unless it has a maserra. In then one could eat it just by checking the simon and check that it doesn't have a similar being trade. But in practice, we only eat birds with a maserra because of this concern that we won't be familiar enough to know whether the bird is a terrorist. It's not as straightforward whether a bird is a terrorist. The Mechaber, to a great extent, accepts this, but leaves room open to accepting certain birds, even without a Masera, if we could be very certain that it's a kosher bird. And the Ramah, so to speak, closes the door and takes this, this sheet of this of a heter completely, and he says, we don't eat any birds unless they have a Masera. And of course, that brings us to our question. Turkey is a New World bird. It's a bird that was discovered in South America, and was brought back to the old word, world. So, of course, there's no Masera that a turkey is kosher because no Yid had eaten it until then, and Moshe Rabbeinu, to our knowledge, never saw a turkey. So, if we only eat birds based on a Masera, how in the world do we eat this bird turkey that we know does not have a Masera? In fact, there were Poiskim that did say that turkey was straight. There were occasional Poiskim, one who Possibly, he was talking about Turkey. Rishon Kluger said it was it was trash. Throughout the diaries, there were individual rabbanim who didn't eat it. The most famous in recent times, of Yaakov Kamnetsky, is reported that to not eat it. But those people were all yotzim and That was by no means the rule. In fact, the truths that talk about Turkey all start off as follows: There's this bird that we all eat it, and everybody assumes that this bird is kosher, but it doesn't have a masera. So how in the world do we eat this? Then follows a lengthy discussion of reasons why we should or should not accept it, all kinds of reasons which we're going to talk about in a minute, and the conclusion is, and therefore, we should continue eating this bird. And that's the, the general 
an outlook of all the truths that talk about it. And that's in fact has been the accepted practice. That basically, yes, there were always individuals who did not eat it, but the general consensus was that people ate it. They considered it to be more to, clear to be kosher. In fact, Dr. Amar brings two passing references. There's a prima godem in the Trafus. In describing the Tsuma Sagidim, a certain kind of Trafus, he talks about turkey as if that's just like a regular bird that he has to talk about. They, this is the Tsuma Sagidim for that bird. And the Navy Huda has a shadow about what happens. Some birds will cook together, and they found out later that one was a Trafus. So we had a shadow about a Tarubis mixed together, and one of, his, one of the birds in that soup was turkey. But it was like as if that was like assumed to be kosher bird. So, we have a question. Why do we eat this bird? We know that it doesn't have a messer. And to strengthen the question is that the truths about Turkey as to whether it is or is not kosher are, to a great extent, from the late 1800s and the, 19th, you know, the 20th century, and followed a, a serious discussion about other birds that had come up in those days. But in fact, these birds had been eaten for hundreds of years before that in Europe. So we have a second question. Where were all the Shilas until then? How come there was no Shilas until, I don't know, the middle of the 19th century do we first start seeing questions about whether Turkey is kosher? What, why were people eating until then? And hopefully we'll get to answer these questions or at least present what Preston had mentioned about. And the answers to this question will be in three different groups. The first group is, some person said, the answer is, because you really don't need a Maserva. Some said the, the minute to eat turkey, which started in the late 1500s, maybe early 1600s in Europe, was before the Ramah. The Ramah brought this minute, but they were already eating it beforehand, which of course is hard to accept because the Ramah didn't make up the minute. The Ramah didn't make up the minute that people started accepting it. The Ramah was reporting a this is a heter, which is based on a Rashi that people have to do for Tyrus. And others said from a different angle, that okay, the fact that we eat turkey is a riot that we don't postulate drama, which that point of course strongly disagreed. We always postulate drama. Everybody knows in, in this thing we also can postulate drama. So these this suggestion that we shouldn't need a messiah, that turkey is a riot that you don't need a messiah is hard to accept. A different approach was that there's an indirect messiah on Turkey. And it goes as follows. The Gemara explains that if a person had a Rebbe who was a hunter, who knows, who's familiar with birds, and knew all 24 trait birds, then if they catch some kind of bird in the street and they know it's not one of those 24 birds, they could eat it. Because they know the 24 trait ones, everything else is kosher, so they could eat it. Of course, giving the impression that there were in fact people who were able to do that. Well, None of them saw turkey, so they must have known the 24 trade birds, and they obviously never saw turkey, so they obviously, this was not one of those trade birds. And later in the day, I understand there's going to be a lineup here of different birds. So in the base measures in Pompadis, so they had all 24 birds, and turkey wasn't there, so it must have been not a trade bird. The question is, the Gemara also says that when a bird, an Osnia, a Paris, is trade, a trait of bird doesn't mean just one specific bird. There are many species or subspecies of a bird that are included in that. So understanding what makes a bird, what how to identify a trait bird includes being able to compare other birds to it and to know what's the same and what's not the same. So I don't know the 24 birds, but maybe if I knew the, if someone who knew the 24 birds and who also knew the science of comparing birds and understanding what's one species, when a turkey would have walked past him, he would have known, oh, there's the dia, that's the one, that's, that's just like a dia, it's another variation of that. So the fact that they never saw it doesn't mean that if they would have seen it, they wouldn't have known which of the trade birds it's like. A riot to this question that I'm mentioning is, Rabbi Zivotowski points out, there's three birds that he mentions, a peregrine falcon, a bald eagle, and an osprey, which are also new world, world birds, and those birds are very trait. The Gemara gives Simon to know a bird is trait. And those birds are very are definitely trait. So you can't say that there were no trait birds that are only New World birds because we know there are trait birds. So the answer back to that is that no, those birds are similar enough to their old world cousins that someone in the times of Hazal would have seen it, would have known that this is in the species of those trait birds. But Turkey is such a 
So it's like a quintessential example of a new world word. It's an example of a word that's so radically different from everything else that there's nothing it could have been possibly compared to. So the person who saw it for hundreds of years knew that it was kosher because it can't be it. This is a trade word. This couldn't have been one of those 24. The, the weakness with this is that we're making, whoever, to suggest this is making an assumption, an assumption that you know all of the birds in the world. You're so familiar with the birds that you can say this turkey is radically different than anything else. Now, I'm obviously not that, and I don't know anybody else who's able to do that, but it's making an assumption that not only is it true, but that the person came through all generations and through the late 1800s also knew that. They're able to look at this bird and say it's so obviously different that it can't be kosher. That it can't be one of the trade birds. I'm not so familiar with all the birds, but just Friday, somebody mentioned to me, he said he had a reason, he, th he thinks that turkey is kosher because it's, this, it's very similar to a bird called a great buster. Now, I looked at the great buster, I don't see the great dimion to the great buster, but okay. But I'm saying I never heard of a great buster, and this person didn't. He thinks it looks like a turkey, so I mean, who knows how many thousands of other birds. Okay. Uh, Rabbi Slipkin can tell us all the thousands of birds that are out there and which is it really so strange. So this whole approach is taking an assumption that it's so obviously different that it can't be that it's kosher. Can't be that it's true. Okay. And the third and maybe the most interesting is the group of Paiskim who try to say in fact there is a Masara in Turkey. Which of course is hard to understand but that's what they want to say. The first group says they saw this bird they said nah it's just a big chicken. Nah, it's the same thing it's just a chicken. Or, or, like what I just mentioned, it's this buster, or, or some other bird. Because they looked at they looked at the turkey, and they knew it was kosher because they could see that it was just like another bird that they knew was kosher. Yeah. If you, in the, in the source book, in the, the Chuba that are very really close to mentioned beforehand, it shows how Dr. Chuba has many ch Shilas brought up about comparing birds, deciding what's like something, what's not like something, and that idea to say that a bird is kosher because it's like something else is very difficult to apply. And as Rabbi Zivdowski says, it's very open to abuse. You know, you can compare anything. I mean, if you if you read enough of the Daki Chubas, you could literally make anything kosher. There's so many choices of what makes something the same. Okay, then there are those who have suggested that turkey breeds with other kosher birds. Since it breeds with kosher birds, it's a right that it's kosher. It's based on the Gemara and Bukharis talking about animals. The animals, trade and kosher animals don't breed together. The weaknesses with this argument are that, first of all, there's a malfocus in the post whether that Gemara applies to birds at all. Even if it does apply to birds, many studies have tried to breed turkey and chicken and turkey with other birds unsuccessfully, by and large unsuccessfully. And even where it was successful, it was, as a rule, it was through artificial insemination. And it's not clear that the Gemara's rule applies even to such cases. And additionally, there's an atziv, an interesting atziv, that says that the fact that we've eaten it for so many dollars gives us a pseudo messiah on it. And now the, the, the people who want to make a trade, they're on the defense. They have to prove that the bird is straight. We sort of, we created a server, so to speak, whatever that means. And then, an original, this one, most original spot, which is when the explorers came to the United States and they found this turkey, they came from, sorry, to South America and even to the, maybe to North America, and they found this turkey, there were people living in the United States, the people living in America. Those people were remnants of the Aceros Hashvatim, who had a sort of back from Russia made that it was kosher. So they got it from there. But by far the most original as far. And then, lastly, lastly, what is true is Turkey was brought back from the New World to the Old World. And from there it spread throughout Europe. One of the ways that it spread was through the Ottoman Empire, which is based in Turkey. And in fact, that's why we call this bird turkey, because people for a long time believed that it came from, it was a Turkish bird. That's where it came from. Other people thought that it came from India, and like in, in Hebrew we call it the uh, Tarnagal Hoidu, we call it an Indian bird. Other people call it that, the Kafachayim says that's what it's called. And 
people got a Messiah from those communities that gave them the bird. That is to say, someone in Poland got these birds from people in Turkey, or got them from people in India, and they turned to these people and they said, I'll begin, he said, this is a kosher bird? And they said, yeah, by us, we eat it. So the Messiah came from the people in Turkey and India. Okay, well, where did the people in Turkey and India get their Messiah from? And with that, that in fact, we, we expect Rabbi Shechter will discuss this topic, which is as follows. As I mentioned, the Machaber says that in certain cases we can eat a bird without a Messiah. It's the Ramal who says that we only eat a bird if it has a Messiah. The Machaber leaves the door open to certain cases eating a bird without a Messiah. Turkey and India, which to my understanding are far and large Sephardic communities, hell like the Machaber, and they may have accepted the bird without what we would consider a Messiah. They had other ways to decide the bird was kosher. They took that bird. Yidin in, in Ashkenazic communities got the bird from them, and these people told them, yeah, the bird has a Messiah. So maybe the most plausible is, in fact, they got it from these people. Those people told them it was kosher, and they continued eating it. They had a Messiah from those other Yidin. So that's a topic that Rabbi Shaptu will be addressing as to is it proper, or when is it proper to take a Messiah from a different community? And if, if in fact, this is true, then we sitting here well, the Ashkenazim sitting here, who know their Messiah comes, in effect, from a Sephardic source, a source that started off with, we know, not a Messiah, so we would have to question then whether that, we, that Messiah would be acceptable for us. To, to summarize, we had a question as to how could it be. We only eat birds that have a Messiah. This bird clearly does not have a Messiah. Some argue that it doesn't need a Messiah. Birds don't need a Messiah altogether. They argue on the Ramah. Some said there's an indirect Messiah because it couldn't have been one of the church birds. And lastly, there were different ideas as to how we could possibly have a Messiah for this bird. Each of these reasons have different questions, factual or Allah questions on them. And the only Nechama we have is, the Gemara says that I feel the hemp and Sadiqim, even the animals of Sadiqim, their version doesn't let them eat trace. And through these hundreds of years, many tzaddikim themselves have eaten turkey, so we can take Nechama that the Barshalom wouldn't have let them be nichsh on it. Thank you. Have a good day. <clears throat> Thank you, Rav David, for your very informative uh, talk on the kashas of Turkey. Uh, I omitted to offer a course of time to Rav David Kohn for organizing the very comprehensive source book that everyone has been handed. Uh, he, he put a lot of work into it, and we appreciate very much uh, his efforts in that regard. And speaking about a chorus of Tov, we owe a tremendous debt of gratitude to uh, the Lander College, uh, to Mr. Colbury uh, from uh, the tour on Lander College, Rebbets and Daniel Lander, Dr. Sokol, the entire custodial crew who have really opened up their doors and their hearts to to host this conference. And of course, uh, Yoshe Baroish is the next speaker who will offer greetings. And he is a person who has become literally a legend in his own lifetime, uh, which teaches each of us what one dedicated and creative individual can do. Uh, I speak of none other than the president and founder of Turo College, Rabbi Dr. Bernard Lander, Please uh, offer us words of greeting. Thank you. It's my, uh, it is my privilege to greet all of you to our institution. This uh, program is being conducted. In honor of the memory of Mrs. Kushner, the mother of Charlie Kushner, a veteran member of our board of trustees. Mrs. Kushner has been noted for her support of total study. She's provided the funds for different issues, especially the famous high school on this event that was founded by her high tights. Welcome, all of you. Something that's fascinating, the problem, a real. I have also been struggling with the question of what is the sort of sort of turkey that we eat, and I'm looking forward to get to it. I I hope this is a major. I think you're asking. I'm not making the major.
chicken that it's like again. Thank you very much, Dr. Wander. Our next speaker is uh, an individual who I think has very often shown tremendous courage, and I think this entire conference it was a very courageous effort on his behalf and his involvement in the in the whole conference and in the whole OU. Of course, I speak of. Uh, the rabbinic administrator of the OU Kashras, whose name is on every letter of certification that you see around the world, the global, the large global network of the OU, and that is none other than Rabbi Menachem Ganak Shlita. I also want to welcome everybody to this conference. I want to thank, uh, we just heard from uh, Rabbi Dr. Bernard Lander, who is a as, as we said, a legend in this time, and, and in terms of the field of education, Jewish education, what he's done is, is heroic and is representative of a, of a man, though his, 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 his eyesight may be fading, but his vision is extraordinary, a man of genius, and it's, I'm happy that I'm able to follow him. I also want to acknowledge some of the people who are in, who are in the audience today, his son was Daniel Lander, uh, who is uh, my closest uh, friend, Rabbi Chabusa, Rabbi Renown, Tamar Chachmiz, Rosh Shiva Rachaim, Rabbi Hershel Shefta, one of the postmen for the OU, um, the uh, head of the, uh, the Kola Achieve University, uh, Rabbi Weinman, the executive vice president of the OU, Rabbi Zweigenhaft, a master shoifet who will be hearing from a little bit later. Uh, and I want to thank all those who were involved, especially Rabbi Grossman, who coordinated everything in putting this program together. And I also want to thank uh, Rabbi, uh, Dr. Chaim Wasman, who is the uh, chairman of the Kashmir's uh, uh, Commission. I, I probably left somebody out, but uh, you'll forgive me. I'm going to speak about, you know, when we began this conference, we thought that this issue about Mesorah, birds, it was a very esoteric issue, you know, sort of like Hilchus Lemeshicha. And as we were planning the conference, two issues came up. I'm going to speak about the second, but we came very much Halach Lemaisa and was played up... Uh, in a, in a, to a large extent in the, in the press, both here in the United States and in Israel. One issue was about uh, the uh, leghorn, which is a chicken, which some people claimed was not, was, the, was not a kosher chicken. And the reason is, one of the simonim for a kosher chicken, the mission says, is that when the um, bird perches, it, it separates its, its four um, fingers or four claws uh, two in front, two in the back, and that's a simon of a non-kosher bird. And it was a claim that this leghorn, which is a is a species of bird which is commonly used for eggs, is as a non-kosher. And all of eggs are not kosher because we have Allah yotzim not tummy tummy. If the, if the bird is not tummy, so that which uh, which which comes of it, the egg, or in the case of a, of a mammal, the milk is not kosher. So that issue came up. In fact, it was resolved. All points can be that it's about the DNA research. In fact, information is inaccurate. Indeed, when it perches in a very precarious uh, position, it will split its uh, its um, its talons or, or fingers, but the toes. But then generally, it does not, and it's put them like that. And other things it's declared to be a kosher bird. The other issue that came up, and that's what I'm going to speak about today, is about the zebu. Um, the zebu is a, is a is a um, kind of cattle that is indigenous to uh, to to India and is commonly slaughtered now in South America. It, it's a strange looking cattle. It has a very fleshy hump and uh, skin under its neck. Its ears droop. It's very unique in terms of its experience. And the issue is, is the zebu kosher? Why not? After all, we know in terms of what determines a kosher species, and I speak about what the determinant is, but in, in terms of animals, a kosher animal is one which is my precious pasha, so shasessa and malagera, split hooves and chews its cud, which indeed the zebu does, and in terms of fish, that has a snap of kashkashas scales and fins. So what, what's the issue about the zebu, since it seems to meet the criteria? Well, the historical background is this. The, um, the shark says, that at this way the Chachmas Adam interprets the Shah. That just like um, the halak is that by birds, in order to eat a bird, we follow the Ramon interpreting the Gmar in the Chul and the Gmar says, since we don't know exactly what the 24 people might not 
know exactly what the 24 birds that are land kosher that I mentioned the Torah are. It's birds only nechel the mesoris. And the Amor interprets that to mean that you, you, with Adam and Sarah, you're not allowed to eat a bird. So offhand, that halacha only applies to birds because birds, the Torah doesn't tell us as it does by fish and animals a certain criteria in what determines it to make it kosher and not kosher. Birds are simply anything which is not one of these 24 is kosher. So there you need a Um However, the Chachmas Adam says, no, that the halacha doesn't only apply to birds. Animals also, even though they're Marcus Pasha, so Sarsas and Malagame and so on, they also have to have a Masurah to, to be eaten. And the uh, Chazan Ish held that this is the correct reading of the Shach, the Chachmas Adam's reading. And the issue came up in the early 50s at the time of the establishment of the State of Israel. Uh, the then chief rabbi, Rav Herzog, Zechon uh, posed this question whether the zebu, which was at the time being slaughtered in Madagascar, which was one of the basic um, sources for, for kosher meat for Israel, can we import the zebu to Israel? And the Chazan Ish, quoting this Chochmas Adam, said that you cannot. Now, the Chochmas Adam is a shtikel achidosh, because offhand, by, as I said, by birds, we can understand that Mars said that you require Messiah. But here, the criteria is determined. Why should you acquire Messiah? And the Prima Godem said that that's not the correct reading of the Shach. What the Shach meant was only to distinguish between a Chaya and a Behema, because the are different halachas. A Chaya requires Kisi Adam, a Behema doesn't. A Chaya, the Chaya of his mother, and by a Behema, the Chaya of his also. So to determine which is a Chaya, which is a, a Behema, which the law has long discussions about, depending on kind of horns it has, those things are not so easily determined. For that, you need a Messiah, but otherwise you don't need a Messiah. That's what the Prima Godem held. And Rov Poskin, Kafachayim, and others held like this Prima Godem. Um, this issue re-emerged now, but because of the Chazanish's opposition, because it was the Chazanish, so the, the, the at least the official policy of the State of Israel was not to input import the Zebo, the meat of the Zebo. Now, um, you know, th- this is the official policy. I remember read after the six, it was after the Six Day War, I remember reading a Newsweek article. They interviewed a sergeant from the Israeli army, who, and uh, they, they had just co- captured a convoy of Jordanian meat. So the Newsweek reporter asked the, the uh, Israeli sergeant, what are you going to do with this meat? The official, army, the official policy of, of Israel is that the, the army only eats kosher. So well, we do a lot of unofficial eating also. So this is the issue that came up right now because it, they discovered 50 years later that, in fact, in South America, a lot of the animals that they're shechting are zebus, and, and some of them, if they're not zebus themselves, but they're a crossbreed of the zebu with the angus, which, um, so, I mean, if, if you follow the tradition of the, of the mother, you know, of the father, so the cautious of this, of this crossbreed um, comes into question. And the one who's dealing with this issue right now is Rabbi Yashif. And his initial sock was, if you have it in your freezer, you don't have to throw out the meat, maybe because there was a rove and so on. But he, but he said they should stop the policy. And they should only now, at least prospectively, only use non zebu But as Rabbi David Cohen pointed out in a recent conference, it's not so trivial to change, because unbeknownst to the population of Israel, the, the zebu has... Its, it's wonderful quality is it's a very hardy animal. That's why it survives in very harsh climates where, there's, where it's very hot and not enough water. It, the downside is it's, it's meat because it's so hardy. It's not as tender. It's not as delectable. Um, but it's hardy. Now, Israel, recent, uh, years ago, imported milking cows from Holland. But they found that they didn't, they didn't do well in the, in, the, in the climate in Israel, which was you know, hotter than uh, the Dutch climate. So what they did at the end was they 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 um, they crossbred the milking cows with zebus. So all the milk, the mahadra milk and so on, that is a, a big portion of it going into the cheese and so on, is a derivative of, of the zebu. Um, so the problem presents itself not only in that context. It was also brought it. There's also a possibility that many of the the cloth or the oils that are used for uh, but Philip Mezuzah also may be derivative of the zebra. Um, Misvara, most folks, as we have pointed out, thought that the zebra was kosher. And I want to speak about whether this halakh of Messiah should apply 
also to behemoths as well, or it should be limited only to offals. That's the prima garden understanding. Um, and I, I thought that this shayla may depend on how we understand the Allah of Messiah. What is the requirement of the Mamoha is based on the Gemara that the Aif is only Nechot the Messiah? There are two ways. Of course, the reason Messiah was established is because it's difficult to determine which of the 24 birds, what's the names of them. Uh, they're, they're, they're not 100% clear. So therefore, we, we insist on the Messiah for those birds. But afterwards, in that halach of Messoyla, what is, what was the, why is there that there's a requirement of Messoyla? Is the pshat simply to suffix? So since it's a suffix, we insist on having the Messoyla to mevar the suffix. The, the Messoyla is not the matir. The matir is, let's say, is that it's the, of toho, but it's not to a bon. Of course, the, the requirement of Messoyla is superimposed. is certainly only to a bon. But that to a bon, is it because it's just additional beer and therefore we need the Messoyla? Or no, the halach is... If you're born on, since the simon is not so clear, which what is of Torah and which is not an of Torah, and uh, the, the Mishnah has different simonim to tell, which, to determine which the 24 are, that's for simonim, that it's, um, that it's not a doy, it's not predatory, that that has an expiasera, which my question is showing you what it means, but let's say that it means that it has the fourth toe is in the back, has extra toe, um, that it's uh, the kukavin is nikloff, and that it has a, um, a zephyr. So these things tell us a simon, but they're not going in the kashus. It's if it's twenty four. It's not one of the twenty four. It's mutter. So, but on the drabon level, the, the matu is also that you need a mesoyim on it. Oh no, it's just a biru. So if the halacha is that it's a biru, so that should only apply to oifus, because by behemoth we know what the biru is. We'll see if it's uh, if it has these criteria, if it's uh, maligera, and if it's mafresh uh, as but if the halacha is that no, that the mesoris because of this, the mesoris is part of the matir, so then maybe they equated oifus. What the gemara says by oifus was also equated to the hand. And I wanted to show you this halacha of mesoris that the gemara speaks about. There is a chalishem midyaraisa of mesoris by by behemis. because Rashi quotes based on the Torah's kronim, and it's really a, it's a, a similar in the gemara menachas with slightly different language. Rashi quotes and the pasuk the yerush mini bezos hachaya. The Rashi says that the Bani Shalom sold Moshe Rabbeinu all the behemoths, the Horus, the behem, and those are not a kosher, those are not kosher. And presumably, if send them, show them the Oifus also, it could be that the Bani showed Moshe Rabbeinu a turkey. Um, it probably, it was imported and they were all sent out. But, uh, um, so it, it, Rashi says that, that Moshe Rabbeinu showed every, the Kali saw, this is kosher, this is not. So you, you see that there was a loch of Masoyah that was cow. And I want to, Rav Shechter has in his Pline Arab, he quotes one of the relic, an interesting hayora. You know, the Ram of Shita is that there's a kind of a uh, insect that's, that if you eat, that you like it for Sheretz Oif and Sheretz Mayim and Sheretz Oritz, the world with the world called it has, it has all these remarkable qualities. Uh, and the writer says, this such a thing doesn't exist. What is the Ram talking about? So we never found such a, such a you know, versatile insect. So, um, but Gorilla quoted in the name of the Briskerov that the Briskerov said like this, any phenomenon that it sees, the vibe is right. You never found such an insect that, you know, does everything. It's, it's a, it flies, it's, it, it swims, it dances, it, it's everything, right? So, but the vibe is not like this, but it But the vibe says that this, since Moshe Rabbeinu showed everybody which each, which behemoth, which insect, and so on, which is Mutter, so it, it doesn't depend on its gene, you know, um, in terms of biologically how we determine it. If it's if it looks like this, since that was what the Mesora was, so it's carbon that has the din of share it's open and so on. All I, sh- I only quote this to show you that there really was a halushem Mesora on 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 what the oifas are. So and we know called because I called tikkun rabbanu came to your eyes of tikkun when chachamah make a a takana. Or a requirement that always falls, they, they don't just invent it out of, at least the, the context of the formulation of it is called the Tikkun Rabban Kendi Raisa Tikkun, falls under the rubric of a Raisa concept. So you see that there is a Chal Hashem as relates to uh, to the medium to Hoyim and to Meriam. And so maybe that's the Mesoyer that's Matthew and, and the Chazanish held based on the Chach Masodim that it applies to Behemoth as well. Um, this issue, I thought, may depend also on another issue. Which is discussed in Nachrayim. Um, we know that by Oifis, there's no simonim to tell us which is an of Torah. It's the the 24 species that are not are not kosher. Those are tmeim. Beyond that, everything is is kosher. But by the Hamas and by Dakim, 
the Torah has, has criteria. So the question is this. Um, I'm going to start with Dagi, and then we'll talk about by, um, by Behemoth. What's the law that, that a dog, in order to be kosher, has to be have a snap of a kashkeshes? Is the pshat, it, this kind of fish is kosher, carp is kosher, salmon is kosher, tuna is kosher. How do we know? The tongue gives us, the tongue that these are the simonim, that it's a mavara, that this is kosher. Oh no, it's not just that it's mavara that's kosher. The thing that's going on the kashkeshes is what? Is the snap of the kashkeshes. So the chor, allied to that, the chor, point this out as well, Levari has it, but I also think the the Gemara is this. The Gemara says that um, everything that has a kashkeshes has a snap here. Everything that has scales has fins, but not everything that has fins has scales. So then it would seem that the, 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 the snap here is completely irrelevant. The Torah doesn't have to tell us about the snap here, because you just check, check it as a kashkeshes, because knowing that it has a snap here by itself will not will not be sufficient. So the Gemara answers, Yad del Tov What does it mean, Yad del Tov? If it's a Biro, so the Sof Kosov, the Snap is irrelevant. It's not going to give us the information we need. And the Kashkes just gives us the, the full information to the scale. But if we say that the Snap of the Kashkes is, is going in the Kashkes, it's what makes it a Kosher Min in terms of Dagin. So indeed, for the Biro, it's irrelevant. But I'll be thin. That's what Yad del The thing that indeed is going in the Kashkes is also the snap here. Now the issue is, what about by the heinous? So, the, the Raga Chova has about this in, in Pasha Shmini on, in the Tzokhmas, the Lech and Kumis, and others talk about it, the Yikas uh, Abbe that talks about it. If someone suggests that by, that by the heinous, the simonim, that it's Malagera and Mafis Pasha, that's not the going with the Kashas. It's this meanest Kasha, right? It, that's just a liar, for her liar. The lie is that the Allah is that if a behemoth to hire gives birth to a, a, the behemoth, it, it, it gives birth to an animal that doesn't have split of course. It gives it to a colored. So the Allah is that it's kosher. I, if, if this is that's going in the kashras, so so we're the simonim that are to be going in the kashras. If it's a beer that this belongs to the kosher species, so it's, it's, the, it's, the, it's mother's kosher, so it's, it's also kosher. But if you need to, 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 be, to create the kashras, that the snap of the, excuse me, the um, Malagero and Mafis Parsa, this is not Mafis Parsa, it's a colored. Why is it kosher? So many of the ones say, you see from there that by, but that by Behemoth, it's just a, it's just a liar, but not that this is the going, the cause of the kosher. I heard the other day, Rav Shechter Shlita said that, no, it could be that, no, it's also that the Simonim are going, but the Simonim of the mother helped for the Vlad. That's the shot. It, 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 this animal is called the Mafreses Pasa. Why? Because the mother is. And just like by Shrita, the Shrita, the mother, helps with the Vlad. So the Simonim of the mother helped for the Vlad. And, and that's called the Kasha. Why do I mention this? Because this also may be relevant. Because if the din is that merely the Simonim are, are, are going in the Kashras, are, are a liar, what, what, this, what, the, what it is, you could say either way, but I was thinking like this, that if, if it's just a liar, so this is the Torah tells you what the liar is. Right? But if it's that it's the Goyim, the Kashras, so then you need maybe the Labiru, you, there's another matter that would namely, on the Jabrul, of course, of Messiah. Um, um, the, the issue of the Zibu remains unresolved. It will live beyond this conference, so we'll have to wait till Rabbi Yosef decides. But the concept that we're, we're dealing with in terms of maintaining the Messiah, I just want to close with this notion that the Rav Salvechik. The Rav Zechon of Rocha said, has in his Yotzeh Shum, he would of, often quote from, from the Chaim that there are two kinds of Mesorah. There's a Mesorah in Halacha and there's a Mesorah in the Maisa. And that's why the Rav said that the Chaim was opposed to the reintroduction of, of Tcheles because, um, because he thought that this Mesorah, what Tcheles is, it, you can't just say a shtickle Torah to determine what it is. You have to have Ishmi Pi East Mesorah. And, and I, I'd say the model to that is, is the is the Missouri that Moshe Rabbeinu introduced, the Zos of what are the Behemoth Kshemis and Nakshemis. But we today are de- dealing, at what this conference means to establish, is in fact the, the Missouri Lemaisa of, of the different Oifers and uh, continue the, this tradition of Missouri on the Maisa as well as the Halacha. Thank you. As we mentioned before, the Besden at the OU is comprised of Rabbi Ganak, Rabbi Shrovelsky, 
And also, our next speaker, uh, who the OU is Nana from tremendously, and also like to give a course of type that Rev Schechter is always available for the needs of the OU, even under very uh, trying conditions. Uh, and uh, it's a great color for me to introduce a rather going with Herschel Schechter. Schlinter. Yesterday, at the end of the Kriya Satur, at the end of Parshish Kedoshin, we read the Pasuk, the Hibdalt and Ben Habeim HaTor LaTmeo Ben Haof HaTomi LaTohar, etc. So the Rambam in the Sefer HaMitzvah uh, counts as four mitzvahs say the following. And the whole uh, Mishnah Torah is uh, based on the Sefer HaMitzvah, beginning of every section in the Mishnah Torah, the Rambam lists off how many mitzvahs he's going to explain here. In the beginning of Hilchas Macholas Asur, the Rambam lists off how many mitzvahs he has here. And the first four are the following. Number one, Libdak Bisimani Behem Babachaya, in order to distinguish between kosher and non kosher. Number two, Libdak Bisimani Haof, in order to determine which birds are kosher and not kosher. Number three, Libdak Bisimani Hachagodim, etc. Number four, Libdak Bisimani Hadogim. These are four mitzvahs Asur. Exactly what does that mean? Libdak Bisimani. Here. When you look in the opening line in the Rambam in Hilchas Macholas Asuras, he writes, "Mitzvahs asay leita hasimanim shemavdilem bein atomi latoha." The Rambam doesn't say that when you shecht uh, an animal, you have to be bodik b'siman. He doesn't say when you catch a fish, you have to be bodik b'siman. He says it's a mitzvah says it to know to know what the simanim are. One could understand the Rambam in the following way. Uh, we know that the uh, Balatanya wrote the Shulchan Aruch, and uh, most of the Shulchan Aruch Arab is just like a Hayodim. It's a kitzer of the of the of the big Shulchan Aruch. It has a liquid from the Taz, from the Shach, from the Magen Avram, whatever. Except the Hilchas Talmud Torah. Hilchas Talmud Torah he rewrote from from the beginning. He rewrote the whole thing. He has Moiri Dikazachim there. So he writes, among other things, he writes one of the main points that the Balatanya brings out is that there is a mitzvah essay, uh to learn Kol Kula. Then he, and he quotes the Psukim from the Chumash and the Sifra and the Sifra, all the Tanaim say like that. So then he says, I, how is that possible? Morris says in Erevin, quoting the Pasuk, Arukam the Eretz Midar, Rechavim in Eyam, that the Torah is so vast. So how is it, in, how is it physically possible? <laughs> Usually have it, uh, the Are we okay? Pasik at the end of Parshish Kedosh and says the Hibdalt and Beam Adar Latmeya and the Rambam and the Seifa Mitzvahs as well as in the beginning of Vilchas Macholas Asuris lists off four distinct mitzvahs. Libdak Bisimani Bahama, Libdak Bisimani Baok, Libak Libdak Bisimani Hachagovin. The Pashtus and the Rambam seems the way the Rambam spells out in the first line. And Elchas Macholas Asur is that it doesn't necessarily mean Libdak when you're about to eat the fish. You have to be buried with Simon. It just says Mitzvah says, Leda Hasiman of Shemabila. So I started to explain. I thought perhaps what the Rambam is driving at is along the lines of the Balatayah, who writes in the Kuntris Talmud Torah that there's a Mitzvah to learn Kola Tarakula. He quotes from the Psukim and Chomish. And then he asked Akasha, how is that possible? It's physically impossible. The Torah is Arukam the Eretz Midar of Minyam. So he says, no, that Pasuk, that Gemara in Erevin refers to the Oymek Pininiyas Havanas Torah. But as far as what is the text of the Torah that you have an obligation to learn, Kala Terakula, that's not Arukam the Eretz Midar. You have a bookcase, and the bookcase consists, uh, yeah, contains so many Yisrael, and that's considered Kala Terakula that you have an obligation to learn. The Pasuk is Kala Terakula. So the Balatanya says it's not such a big library, it's just the 24th form of the Tanakh. The Mishnayis, Talmud Babli, Yerushalmi, Sifros, the famous Hilte Rama, and Shokhan. I'm glad it's not so much. I'm glad it's not so much. A person who's in English literature probably has to read more books than that. But that's all, that's the text. That's what you have to learn, Kalat Kula. The rest is the Havana Satera. Then you have libraries and libraries and libraries. That's a rukam there, it's me, the rukam 
So now the question is, and that's all, that's the whole text that you have to learn is just Tanakh, Mishnayis, the Trost, the Shpein, the Chilte, Talmud Babishan, that's all. So they quote in the name of the only guy, and there's a little bit more in addition to that. So they quote to Migro that to know the geography of Eretz Yisrael is a chilk of Talmud Hatter. I don't know the geography of Eretz. I don't know what's north of it. I don't know anything. So they quote from the Bible going like that based on the Zohar. That Moshe Rabbeinu was the Ish HaTayra. And the Rabbi Shalom showed him. He was howling to see Eretz Yisrael. Rabbi Shalom showed him. He showed him all the borders. So that's also considered a chilk of Talmud Hatter. So the Ramam here, the beginning of Hilchas Machalas Asur, seems to be saying, that to know enough biology in order to be able to say over what determines whether this is a kosher bird, or this is a kosher fish, or this is a kosher animal, or this is a kosher chagor, uh, a grasshopper, or whatever, this too is a chemical palmetor. It's not just a hechitimt to bauma. If you won't know the biology, so you won't be able to pass in the shayla. No. Knowing the biology. Uh, who wants to, a person who wants to fulfill the nits of lima, kala, terakula, who has to learn and everything has to know this also. Has to know enough biology in order to know this as well. But true, they quote, Rabbi Shosh Glover quotes in the name of the Dome Goyen that the extent that a person will be lacking in Shara Chachmas, he will be lacking Meir Yodos, the Chachmas but he doesn't say that that itself constitutes a mitzvah of Talmud When you're studying biology, you're studying physics, you're studying chemistry, or uh, medicine, whatever, that itself is not Talmatar. That's a Hashem mitzvah, that's a Hachana. To the extent that you'll know the other Hachmas, you'll be Matzli of more and more. That's where the social law records in the name of the Dome of But over here, it would appear from the Ramam that this itself, to know the biology, to know enough biology to be able to say over the simonim of the Heim and Dogim and Oifers and Chagogim, this itself is a Chelik of the mitzvah of Talmatar. In the Sefer Achinot, these, these four mitzvahs are presented a little differently. Sefer Achinot says that when a person is about to eat the fish, he has to be buried to see more. A person is about to eat the flesh, he has to, he's about to shake, he should be buried to see more of the, of the animal. Uh, what does it mean? It means, uh, of course, you have to be buried. You may be eating non kosher food. So the man has elaborates on what the Achinot said. What it means is that the, even if the right is, the likelihood is that it's probably kosher. And let's say the person eats the food, and then later on he checks it, and he sees that it has the money tire, and it's a glowing Muslim affair that it was kosher, but if he ate it before being buried, so uh, he was over, he was miraculous mitzvah saseh. So mitzvah saseh to be buried with simon. Of course, in the back, it should points out, what do you mean? Every time a buried with simon, of the fish, and every time a buried with simon, when the, when the sheikh checked, checked uh, chickens, he buried with simon. He doesn't look at the zethic and the kukulat, he doesn't look at anything. The answer is, if you don't know what the min is, if the min shady or dua, then the dark shuva says, then there's a mitzvah to be buddy to see one. If I know that this is this type of a fish, and this is a cow, every time I shake the cow, I have to check to see if it's mal again, my first person. No. Shech it sees it's a cow. He shakes it, next he shakes it, he sees it's a cow. It doesn't have to be buddy to see one. If you don't know what the, what the min is, then you have to be buddy. That's what the dark shuva points out. What is this all about? So we know that the Ramban, has a cloud that's put in your day that whenever there's a meal tamatsu, you have to be choshish for the meal, you, you have to be burdik. You don't rely on the right whenever there's a meal tamatsu. What does it mean a meal tamatsu? That's also a question. The Mishkan Asiyakim says a 10% chance of violating an Easter, and the Rabbi Yashiv uh, has a more stringent opinion. His view is at 7.5%. They both are learning based on the same Gemara and Baba Basra. So Rabbi Yashiv thought that the Pshat and the Gemara was that it's seven and a half percent, not ten percent. So there, the Ramban says that's a din with the Rabbana. You have an obligation to be boydeg, not to rely on the roi. If it's a meal tamot, so that's a chumer with the Rabbana. So the Ramban writes the first. That's not a din with the And here, the Sefer Achinach understands this mitzvah b'dikis niman. And number one, it's a din with the It's not a din with the Rabbana. And number two, not only do you have to be boydeg with simanim. When you have a meal tamatsu, even if you're dealing with a meal chain tamatsu, you still have a mitzvah as a unless the min of the behem of the oath is your dua. If it's not your dua, that's what the boss can say, even if it's a meal chain tamatsu, there's still a mitzvah to be buried to see one. Unless our three days of Frank has a long chuba where he left, unless it's such a far fetched meal, it's a, it's a echad mine yalat, it's such a good right that it would be good, you wouldn't even consider it a selfie when it comes to self exaltanus the fashions, you would ignore it. And many elephant elephants. So then, such a such a big roy, overwhelming roy. 
So then there's no mitzvah to be perfectly simanim by the eye of the But otherwise, that's how the Seifer Achinach understood. Now, according to the Seifer Achinach, this mitzvah to be perfectly simanim only applies if you're, if you're interested in eating the day or the eye. If you're not interested in eating it, does, uh, the whole mitzvah doesn't apply. Absolvation used to point out the Ramam has another mitzvah, and the Minya mitzvah is called Sipa Tahar What does that mean? It's a mitzvah to eat kosher chicken. And whenever there's a mitzvah, it's not clear how often you have to do the mitzvah, so it's assumed once a day every day. The Gemara says, the time and have to do it once a day every day when called upon. That much you have to do it on the second time a day. The Ramam says, Tfilo, Tfilo Bechal Yom is an obligation. Men are told, once a day every day. Why? Because the Pesach says, you have to dab him. It doesn't say how often, so it's understood that it's once a day every day. So there's a mitzvah once a day every day to have some chicken. How can it be? In nine days? And there's no apple mitzvah, no one has any chicken. The answer is no. It doesn't mean it's a, it's a kilo matzah. Yes, Rabbi, what's the only apply. If someone is interested, you can't say there's a mitzvah to go eat an exotic bird to be buried to see one to eat the exotic bird in order to preserve the master. What do you mean? According to the Sefer the mitzvah is if one is interested in eating a specific bird, it has to be buried to see one. According to the Rambam, the Rambam doesn't say the same as the Sefer Chinat. The Rambam seems to say that it's a chelik of Talmud Teres. So according to the Rambam, it would be a mitzvah to preserve, to write on the books again. You don't have to eat it. You don't have to shaft it. No mitzvah to shaft it. It's it, like the whole Torah Shabbat there. The Gemara says in Tumur, the Chachamim saw the Torah Shabbat there was going to be forgotten. So because it's Lash Lashem and Fair Torah Shabbat, say he tiro, they allowed us to write down the Torah Shabbat there. Originally, they didn't want a drum Shabbat there. It was Yatar HaShaliyam B'Ksav. It wasn't permissible. It wasn't permissible to write it down. And then they saw it's going to be forgotten, so they allowed us to write it down to make sure that we preserve the whole Torah Shabbat there. So according to the Rambam, the summit's a mitzvah to write everything down in a sefer and to popularize the sefer. That's Taka. A few people published the very fascinating svarim and they printed all the masar. So all of these masar of the different birds will be preserved. So we're, we're covered over here. The Chumish, I mean, like mentioned earlier, the Chumish tells us regarding the simonim of the aim and chayyot, the way to determine whether any given animal is kosher or not, is malagir mafiz tarsa. That's what it says in the Chumish. Then the Torah has a Pasuk in Chumash Dram and Pashas Re'e Shisua. May not be eaten. What is the Shisua? So the Gemara says the Shisua is an animal that's Malagera and Mafis Parsa, and it's still also Bachila. Why is it also Bachila? Because it has Shnei Gab and Shnei Shedra. It has two backs, two spines, as a split uh, back. So the Gemara has a Machlech, it's Rabbi Shmuel. What does that mean? So Rabbi is of the opinion that uh, biologically, medically, such an animal cannot exist. It can't live. So it can't live, so there's nothing to discuss. So what do you think of Pasuk that says you're not allowed to eat it if it can't exist? Mar says, no, it must be talking about a Pentakua Shesua. If you shech the, the blood is the uber is nita v'shkita simo, so if the uber is an abnormal development and it has a shnei gab and a shnei shatra, so uh, it's not included in the heter of Pentakua. I remember when we were learning every day, as the Rav Soloveitchik said to the Talmudian, and don't laugh, he said he used to give Ashkrochus on a slaughterhouse in Boston, and he says he, didn't, he wasn't there uh, every single day. He used to come to check from time to time. And he, when he was there, he saw on quite a few occasions Ben Kukur He says it's not such an unusual uh, occurrence that there's a, such an abnormal development, uh, Ben Kukur So And Shmuel disagrees, and Gemara Shmuel says, no, such an animal can't exist. Uh, if you would have a ben pekua shesua with akabi nita b'shkita sima, the pasuk goes on that min. There is such a min, and shnei gab and shnei shedrois, and therefore it's also bachim. So there is a question in the rishonim: How we're supposed to pass them? So in Shulchan Aruch we pass them machlekes rabbi Shmuel, and you don't have any echret from the gemara one way or the other. So we follow the usual klal that whenever it's an issue of this or the other, like this is, so we follow the opinion of Rav. So the Torah Nima, so we pass on Allah that a Ben Pekua Shisua is also because we assume there can't be such as a min of a Shisua. It couldn't, couldn't exist, couldn't survive. So the Torah Nima, and that Pasuk quotes this whole discussion, Rabbi Shmuel and the Psaq and Yeridea, and then he quotes Akasha, that they wrote up in the books on uh, biology that there is such a wild animal in the African jungles, that Malagar, Mapis Parsan, Shnei Gab and Shnei Shedra, and it does exist. 
So he, he quotes that the Rabbana and Mormon are the shine, and maybe we should reverse the Psaq in the early days. Since we found out that such an animal does exist in the African jungles, so we see that Shmuel is right, so maybe we should pass like Shmuel. Rather, the Ritva, he doesn't quote it. The Ritva quotes like that. The Ritva quotes, uh, I think, the Raivet or some other Rishan will say, I saw such an animal, so I, I know that Shmuel is right. So I all the halacha is like Shmuel. You can't apply the regular Kal Hilchus to Rabbi Yisur, because one of the Rishan writes, I saw the animal with my own two eyes, and it does exist in the Shem, so Shmuel was correct. So the third meme quotes such a. So the Rishan said that they saw it, so they also saw it, but, but it, didn't, it didn't survive. He saw it then for Kurash Yisur. He didn't see that there's such a meme. That's the shadow whether such a min exists or not. So the so the third Nima quotes from the biology book. But if, if, if a hundred, uh, over a hundred years they made a mistake and they thought that that was a Malagera, so could we, we can make a mistake on Malagera? Could we, we can make a mistake on, on Mafis Pars also? Could people think that something is Mafis Pars? So we we'll come to the realization that it's not a Mafis Pars. So we can understand the concern for, that, that's involved, the hashash that's involved in just saying we're going to follow the din and the chumash. It could be about that we will misidentify. There is a Gemara Mechores that was dying on the Dalit, but the Gemara quotes Rabbi Shul Ben Levi, who claims a biological uh, principle that the Olam Ein Misaberis Tamei and the Tahorah or Tahorah Mitamei, that you cannot have that a, uh, a behemoth, two behemoths should mate together and have a lot if one is kosher and one is not kosher. If one is a behemoth or one is behemoth, it's impossible physically that they should have a lot. So the Hassan Seifer. Quoted by the Tzitzit Shuvah in the other days in the Bay Bay, some say, and his Shuvahs as well as Dabne Nezir, quotes it on the Hasam Seif, and he elaborates on it. So they assume that if you have a behemoth to Horah, like, so you know that this cow is kosher, and then you see that this cow mates with a zebu, and you don't know whether the zebu is kosher or not kosher. You have no masur, you don't know anything. You don't know it's malagir, you don't know anything about it. But you know that it's moilet. The two are moilet together. So if the two are moilet together, so then, uh, then the Chassam Sefer says, based on this Gemara, that the Tanei is not misaberis minat da'ira. That since we eat the da'ira, so the so the Tanei, the, the questionable animal that we don't know whether it's kosher or not, they have rat that has to be kosher as well. And the masora that you have, even if you hold like the Chach Masodim, that the minig is that you require masora on on behemoth to determine whether it's behemoth or not. But we have a masora on the kosher animal. And the fact that it mates together with the questionable animal, so the master on the kosher animal carries over on the questionable animal. The question is, what about in birds? What's the story regarding birds? So I'd like to discuss that a little bit. If you look in the Chumash, I'll go back to the beginning. If you look in the Chumash, the Torah lists of 20 non-kosher birds. Rashi, on Parsha Shemini, says there are 24. How 24? The Chumash only has 20. Keep on counting and counting. So the Gemara is like Hashem. The Gemara in, in, uh, in Chulin quotes that Bryce said there are 24 of his men. Then what's the book kind of 24? You look in the Chumash, there are only 20. Then the Gemara says, no, look in Chumash, uh, there are 21. So the Bryce is only 21. How did it become 24? So the Gemara says, truth of the matter, it's not 21. There are only 20. But it says four times, Lemino, Leminehu, Leminehem, and so on. So since it says four times, so this is Marv, uh, another four birds. So you have the 20 listed explicitly in the Chumash, plus another four that an Esrava from the Limineo. So there are 24 birds. So then the Gemara says, then the Gemara came out says the Ferish, that it doesn't really, it's not really a matter of whether these 24 birds are not. Either it's Halakha Lamashim Yisinai, or the Tanoi made a drush from the Midrash Atari Adresh, it's not one or the other. It's interesting, Rabbi Chaim Salvechik has a long tilpul on the Rambam on this topic, so he throws in an expression that it's halacha l'mashim yisina. So 
the interesting thing in Mara, I don't know, you get the impression that Allah Hamash is, you know, it's Midash Atta and it rushes them that they, they were learning at Tarashava here. So the, so the Tanoim leave out in the Mishnah, they leave out the listing of the 24th bird. It says in the Mishnah that we have five different simonims to determine whether any given bird is kosher or not kosher. And the whole discussion that the Rishonim have is based on the Girsus and the Gemara and based on what the Maskanas and Gemara is, whom do you pass the light? How do you, what combination of these five simonims do you require? The Mishnah has five simonims. One simon is that it has to have a zefek. A zefek is the crop. A sack where the food is contained for a long time. I think before it goes down the food pipe. And then it has to have uh, the SB is there, the Rabbi Ganak spoke about before. The question exactly what that's referring to. And then it has to have the cork of a nitlof. You have to be able to seal off with your hand the inner lining of the puppet, of the gizzard, of the of the ice. So the knife tahar can be easily removed with the hand. If you need a knife to remove it, the Gemara is not so convinced. But it's going to be, that's the crook of a nickel. You have to be able to remove the inner line. That's what the Pishkei Shuvah quotes, that now the Shuvah from the Hasam Seif and Yerdeh and Isim, that there were some Rabbanim who misunderstood that to crook of a nickel, crook of a nickel means you have to be able to peel off the outer membrane that's around the outside of the crook of a. So the Hasam Seif complains there were Maksha tracer birds and they also Tosha birds based on whether the outer membrane could be removed by hand. So if some say says that that's totally incorrect, it goes on the inner membrane, not on the outer membrane. Okay. So these three simonim are mentioned. The Mish- then Mishnah has the fourth simon that the oak should be eno dores. The different interpretations what that means, Rashi or the Atam, different shorten. And then it has the fifth simon from our blood of Rapsodi, whether the fingers are split two and two. The birds, a lot of birds have four fingers, so there's a split uh, two Eichelikus Raglos. Does it have two toes in the front and two toes in the back? Then it's an Eichtami. Or does it have three in the front and one in the back? Then it's an Eichtami. Let's be is another, another claw. And, and Eichelikus Raglos is the fifth claw. So the whole discussion in the Gemara with the Rishayim and their different gears in the Gemara is what combination of these five considerations do you need? How much do you have to have? And there are different gears in the Gemara. It's interesting, this is known as the Sugi of Nesher. Because the Nesher is the non kosher bird. That's the shadow of what the Nesher is. So the Rabbi Tam says that we always say the Nesher is an eagle. The Rabbi Tam says the Nesher is not an eagle. He says, people say it's eagle, all of you, you, Gimel, I, and Lamed. But the Rabbi Tam says in Thesis it's not an eagle. And he proves from the Gemara it's a different bird. Okay, it's got to really what the Rabbi Tam says. So the mind, the bottom line, you have the Nesher right about this Sugi that it's so complicated as it's a uh, Amuka uh, Mineyam, very, very deep Sugi. In fact, I seem to recall from, uh, from Yiddish uh, literature, either Mendel or Shalom or uh, Shalom Aleichem, one of them, I forgot already which one, one of them wrote a description of Talmidim sitting and learning, they managed they were learning for three, four weeks straight the Stugia of Nasher, and so to get caught in the base marriage back and forth, back and forth, they kept on learning it, back with a few blood Gemara, and a long Balamor, and the Balamor goes a long area, there's old Mohammed there, just the Balamor. It goes the whole tool for the whole Arikha. So this apparently was a very famous uh, studio in Europe. And those yeshivas where they learned uh, Chulin. Those yeshivas they learned only Rosh And those yeshivas where they learned Chulin. So they spent an awful lot of time on this studio. So bottom line, Allah Alamai said, there are five different sheets of Psaq Allah. I'll run through briefly, because it's a little relevant. Rav Sadi Goyen's opinion is, and this is quoted by the Raman Allah. I'm sorry, you in his commentary on Chumash, and there are quotes this from the Goanim, that uh, you have to have a combination of two factors. You have to have it should be, oh, should be Eno Dores, plus any one of the other three, either Zephyr, or Kulkaban and Niklof, or Ezbe Yaseva. <laughs> then the second sheet is basically the same, but the Ram- Raman quotes first, Rav Sadi Gohan, and then he says, and the minute from the Goanim is that we only allow it if you have the combination of Eno Dores plus that the Kurkavan is Nikla. Then it has it that you don't rely on the other two possible combinations. Enadoris plus a Zephyr, or Enadoris plus an SB Yisera. That's what the Magomishna says, that the Rabbi Nechamano quotes this as a tradition, and the Tesis and the Rishanim always said, we have to be concerned about what the Rabbi Nechamano says, called Rav Diri Kabo. So the Raman writes, Nikir at the end is like Rav Sadi Goyen, Enadoris plus any one of the other three Simanim, and the meaning is that we insist that and Enadoris plus Kurkavan Nikla. The third opinion is Rabbi Moshe Rabbi Yosef. This is one of the great Rishonim that uh, we have very little information about. The Balamor quotes him, the Yabamor quotes him in a few places. 
Well, more than that, the Rebbe, everyone looks up to this Rebbe, but Rebbe Yosef, so he has a, a whole combination based on his years in the Gemara. In the Maskana, he reads, if you have all the greasy money of Zephic, if you have the crop, and the cook of his Niklaf, and you have the Yetzbiyasera, then the animal is kosher. And then he says, if you have a combination of two of the Simonim, Kokum and Niklav plus Etzbi Yisera, Kokum and Niklav plus uh, Zephik, whatever, any combination of two out of the three, plus that it's Eno Dores, that will also be Mutter. We said before that Rambam quotes from the Goyenim, all you need is that it should be Eno Dores plus any one of the three. So Moshe Bagheza says, no, you have to have Eno Dores plus two of the three, or if you have all three Simonim, Kokum and Niklav, and uh, Zephik, and as you say, then it's Yodua that is kosher. A <laughs> uh, fourth sheet uh, is the Rabbeinu Tam. Rabbeinu Tam, long, Taisus, and the Rabbeinu Tam disagrees with uh, a few things that Rashi says, a few things that the Gaidu says. Rabbeinu Tam says you have to have all the three Simon. You have to have Zephik, as the Yisera, Kukum, and Niklaf, and then if you have all three, so it's Yodua that is saying that you don't have to bother to check to see if it's Doris or not. And then you have the fifth opinion, is Rashi's opinion. Rashi in his commentary on the Gemara says, you have to have a combination of four factors. You have to have Zephik, Esbi Yisera, Kluruk of the Nikla, plus Eno Dores. And then Rashi, okay, nice. Then Rashi adds on. But the Gemara, that tell Tamai, the Gemara says that there was a certain bird that they always assumed was kosher because they looked at it and they saw that it's Eno Dores. They thought for a long time that it was Eno Dores, so they always used to eat the bird. Then after a long while, they came to the realization that they made a mistake, that that bird really is Dores. So therefore, they have the Aserit. That's the Tanagol the Agma. The Gemara says there are two birds, Tanagol the Agma, Tanagol to the Agma. So the Tanagol the Agma was mistakenly identified as a bird which is Eno Dores. When they came to the realization that it is Dores, so they had an Aserit. So Rashi adds on that since you can easily make not easily. Since you can make a mistake in identification, like we said, for over a hundred years, the Chachmi Rumasoila made a mistake in identifying this animal, a wild animal in the jungle, as an animal that was Malagera. And then Rabbi Lemji quotes that just uh, less than 10 to 15 years ago, I think 10 to 15 years ago, they had a world conference and they came to the realization and made a mistake. It's not a Malagera. So Rashi says over here also, since he can make, since they marked that sale, that they made a mistake, on a bird. They, the the Tchahami made a mistake. They were eating a bird thinking that it's saying the Doris and came out that it was Doris. So Rashi insists, you always have to masar, you always have to have a masar when you want to eat a bird because you may be making a mistake in identifying any one of the four conditions that is required. You need the after you say it with the Zephic, with the Kurkum and Niklof, with the Eno Doris. You may be making a mistake on any one of the four conditions that is needed, so you need a masar. So from all of these five opinions that we mentioned, we said, Rapsadi Goyen Shita, the Raman quotes Mikra, the Rabbin Hanano, the Raman quotes as a minute, that they only insist on Krokov and Nikla, the Tzir of Eina Dur. And then Rabbi Shabbat Yasef requires more. And then Rabbi Natan requires more. Rashi requires the biggest Machma of all. So the Ramon and Shulhanar says, the Ramon quotes the Rosh, and the Rabbin Yeruchim is the Talmud of the Rosh, of course, going to say the same as the Rosh. And the Yisra the head from the Abdin Yoyna, so they say we follow Rashi's opinion on both accounts. Number one, we need a combination of all four, all the three one and plus Eina Doris. And number two, we follow Rashi, that Rashi said you have to have a Masora, because he may be identifying it incorrectly. Now, when we talk about a Masora, what do you mean a Masora? Masora, all the way back to the days of Moshe Rabbeinu. It's very hard to identify that you have a Masora back to the days of Moshe Rabbeinu. In this uh, fascinating sefer uh, by Zohar Amar on Masor Sa'of, that uh, much uh, he, he's apparently a good friend of uh, the two uh, young men who came to marry to Israel, uh, Dr. Greenspan and Rabbi, uh, Rabbi Dr. Zivotovsky. So he keeps on quoting them in his, in his fascinating book. Um, so he quotes those who say that uh, Turkey is kosher, we have a Masar all the way back from the days of Moshe Abbein. Tell us, how could be a Masar from the days of Moshe Abbein? So it's very hard to say that somebody has a Masar from the days of Moshe Abbein. So the question is, where, where do these Masars come from? So the Pashtus is a Masar, means that some Oren Goro made a Drishva Hakira, and he established that you have Korkiba Nikla, and you have uh, Zephek, and you have Esbiyaseir, and you have Enoteres, and it's been established by a reliable uh, Paisik, right? A reliable Mara that this bird is kosher. 
So in his community, they eat it based on his chocolate. It doesn't necessarily mean you have a Masora that dates back hard to tell that the community has a Masora that they claim goes back all the, all the way back to the days of Moshe Rabbein. So this is a this is a question that goes as follows. The the Beis Yosef in Yeridea quotes what he understood is a machlekes between the Rashba and the Rosh. What if one community, according what Rashi says, that you need a Masora in order to eat a bird? So what exactly does that mean? It means that I live in this community, my community has to have a Masora. What if in Prague they have a Masora that a certain life is tar, and I live in Berlin? Can I rely on the Minik? Can I rely on the Masora of Prague? So they say to quotes what he understood as a, as a machlek is between the Rajbo and the Rosh, where the one from one community can rely on a Masora from another community. So because he understood that this is a machlek, so he reckon, the Chaba recommends that one should go to Chumrah and not eat such a bird, unless his community has such a masur. The Shach on the Yerudah takes issue with the Beit Yosef, with the Mechaber. And he thinks that, the, in his understanding, there never was such a Mechlekes. He thinks that those Rishonim who say that one community can be lying on the Masur of another community means in that community, we don't have any Masur at all on this bird. The bird is not much in the We live in a certain part of Europe where this bird never appears. Uh, so then, if in the other community, a different part of Europe, a different part of Asia or in Africa, if they have a Masur, such a bird as Russia, so good, so everybody in the world can rely on their Masur. But if I live in a community where we have a tradition that we bedafke, do not eat this bird, the Rabban told us, you see that bird that's roaming around, don't eat it. So we have a Masur left, or so then we can't rely on the Masur of the other community. Lot. This is how the Shach suggests. So the Shach thinks that Nikki Razin, you can't follow the Masur from another community. However, and the Chuvis of the Tzemach Tzedek, not uh, the Lubavitcher Tzemach Tzedek, the one who is uh, earlier, the earlier Tzemach Tzedek. Uh, if the Chuvis, I'm not saying, of course, it's Tzemach Tzedek. It's in the year, it's in the day. So the Tzemach Tzedek in his Chuvis points out, we're talking about a Masur that they have in Prague or in Berlin or whatever, and Frankfurt, the Masur is probably, don't take back all the way back to the days of Moshe Rabbeinu. Masorah go back maybe a few generations. So who is the Bala Machabra of the Masorah? Who is the one who originated it? So the Pashtun says, some Eurohiro in that community investigated the issue, and he established that this is a nice Torah, and based on his Pesach, the Bala Bata needed. So the, so the Tzermach Tzedek says, it could well be that this Masorah was originated by one of the Paskin who doesn't hold like Rashi. Rashi, she says, you require all the four Simon. It could be that they followed Rav Sadigon and the Rambam. It could be that they were Svartim. And even in Germany, where you would think that they would follow Psokim uh, of I live in Washington Heights. So in Breuer's community, they say uh, all the for the Svartim. They don't, they don't say the Haftaris for the Ashkenazim. And on the second day, Rosh they don't say Shef Yalom, Kiyah Shafer. And on the morning of Purim, they don't say Shef Yalom, Mikam Megillah. They follow the Rambam. They follow the Mechamba. They have a lot of things that they follow Svartim. So just because everybody lives in Germany it doesn't necessarily mean that they're following Minigashna. It could be that they have Rabban and Moira Hirabu as Svardashit, who followed the Rambam, they follow Rabbi Hanan Ali Gaimim, they follow Rabbi Shab Rabbi Yashi, they follow Rabbi Yasam, they don't necessarily follow Rashi. The Ramah says that we follow Rashi who insists on all the four Simon, and Bain Adarit, Kurkuba Nikla, etc. etc. You have to have everything. So that's what the Tzemach Tzedek points out. It's problematic. Even if you follow the Shach, that we can rely on a Masar, we don't have, we, our community has no Masar one way or the other. We have the right to follow Masar of another community. That's only by that, by Mamurim, if their Masar goes back to the days of the Tanoi, goes back to Moshe Rabbein. But the Masar is a few generations old. Maybe it was instituted by Moira Hara, who held like a different sheet. So how can we follow their opinion? And basically, that's the impression that I got from this uh, fascinating Sefer that Masar is all by this Zohar Amar. He writes that he, in his opinion, that he writes in his introduction, he's guessing. He thinks that many of the masters of the Svartim were originated by Rabbanim, who felt like Rabbi Moshe Rabbi Yosef, or they held like uh, like the Rav Sadi going in the Ramam, that you don't need somebody to see like the Rabbanim the Ram. They didn't really hold like Rashi. So how is it you talk and the whole shot doesn't apply? They can't follow their master. Yes, I think we have, based on the Ramam that we started off with, I think we have an obligation to preserve the entire Torah of Alpeh. We have an obligation to preserve all of the masters and tactics of fun. Doesn't that tell me we have to chef the birds and eat them? We should publish a safer. One safer, and this safer that I read by Zohar, my quotes a few others for I'm sure they're all uh, fascinating. And uh, we should study these uh, topics and we should discuss them. But it doesn't tell me we have to eat them. Now, we mentioned uh, earlier, this is also relevant to our love, we mentioned earlier that uh, 
the Gemara Mkhurs Dav Zayin quotes Rabbi Shur Ben Levi that we assume a biological fact that the behemoth Tmei and the behemoth Torah cannot be Mishkabe Echad Men Achas Men Ashriya and to be more little of Lad Bar Kayom. So if you see that this happens, you have a behemoth Torah with another animal that's questionable and the more little blood is that a Bar Kayom. So the Chsam Sefer quoted by the Pishchit Shuvah Ma'aloch and the Amunezer also relied on this, they assume that uh, this is a clear indication that the other questionable animal is in it or so this applies to Oifus as well. So the Chassam Seifer writes, yes, but he's not sure. He's not 100% sure. And there's Chuba. And then the Avnei Nezer picks up on this Chassam uh, Seifer, and he insists that it has to be yes, yes. And he proves from the Gemara, okay, as a Harifus, they can prove that. Rabbi Shulman Levi in the Gemara makes this statement twice. And once he says it, Balash and the Kema, once he says Balash and Zaha. Once he says, ain't me mis aber is mitahara, ve ain't tome mis aber mitahara. So he says, why did he say it? Once a Lashen Zach, once a Lashen Nekev, because Oif is always Lashen Zach, and Behemah is always Lashen Nekev. So half of the memory of Shemalai goes on Behemah, and half of the memory goes on Oifus, and that's it, the Achrat that it goes. It's clear that not all of the Rishonim agree with the Avnei Nezah. The, the Chatzofik of the Chatzam said was whether the Klara of Shemalai be applies to Oifus or not. It's clear that there are the Avnei Nezah himself quotes. There are, there's a Tesis who the Tesis doesn't hold. Like uh, like the Abinazer, the, the Gemara we mentioned the Gemara before. The Gemara distinguishes between the two birds. One is Tanagolta, the Agma is kosher bird, and Tanagolta, the Agma is a non kosher bird. So one opinion in Tesis and Nida, the Afnuna Mebeis, this Gemara is in Chulin and it's called Rosh Nida. So one opinion in Tesis is that it's the same min. The Zohar is Tame and the Nikeva is Tahira. It's the exact same min. It's Muta. There's no Kilayan. It's no kill, I'm an it's the exact same in. And despite the fact that it's the exact, uh, despite the fact that it's the exact same min, one is Tami, one is Tahar. And, uh, and then Moilu, it's not as So you see that the fact that they're Mesab and Mechad Menasheni, that is not a proof that they're both Tahar. So that's one opinion in Tesis like that. The predominant opinion in Tesis is not so. The Tesis in Chulun doesn't just say that that's ridiculous. And the Tesis in Nida, that's not base for the first day of the Tesis thoughts like that. That is the same min, the Zechayim are non kosher, and then the Kavis are kosher. And then the second day, the Oyesh Lama, that's the way they wrote in, in Chulun, that it's not so, two different minutes. Yeah. Uh, just parenthetically, Rabbi uh, Genak mentioned before that there is a discussion in Achreinim regarding the nature of the, um, of the Simonim, whether these Simonim, let's say, Malagam, Afis Parsa, by the Vein, or the Simonim with respect to Oyesh, the Korkman Niklop, etc., all the Simonim, whatever Simonim are needed. Does this mean that these simonim make the animal, this is what makes the animal kosher? No, these simonim are simonim to identify that this is a mintar. And then once you, ident- once you establish that this bird is a mintar, so even if it won't happen to have those simonim, it will also be kosher. So Rabbi Khan of Asman claims that that's exactly the machlekes over here in Texas. One opinion, the first opinion in the Texas and Nida, that's known on the basis, that the exact same min, Tanagola the Agma, Tanagola the Agma, the exact same min. One is the male, one is the female, and the male is non kosher and the female is kosher, the exact same men. Nonetheless, the Simonim are what is not there. And the other opinion in Tyson says that's ridiculous. How can it be? I get some enough tar tar. That's impossible. It's all minachod. If it's minachod, so it has to be that it's all tar. It's impossible to say that half of the men is tar, half of the men is tar. So Rabbi Hanan suggests that he thinks that that's the machlek. Now, the pastors could well be that this cloud in the Gemara, that if you have uh, two behemoths that in the Sabrim, Echa, Achas, Menashni, or you have two, even if one should assume it applies to Oifas, like the Avinezer, that if you have two Oifas and one is Mesabra from the other, uh, and one is known to be Torah, the other one must be Torah, Ashtas perhaps says that this is only if the Mesabrim in a normal fashion. What if it's done through artificial insemination? So this, there's no Hechrit in the Gemara, that the Gemara should be talking about such a thing. So what if you have a situation where you'll have artificial insemination and there will be a Vlad Bar Kayama? What will be, and, and the fact that they have a Vlad Bar Kayama does not sound, that's the way they do it now. A lot, a lot of these, a lot of these uh, hybrids, hybrids are not done through a natural process of being together, but rather it's only done through artificial insemination. So the shadows, what will the status of the Vlad be? What's back of the thing? If one, the Zohar and the cable, one is Tommy, one is Tar, what will the status of the Vlad be? So the Avni Nezer quotes again from the Chazam Seifer's Shuvah. 
So the Chasam says, right, Colossian, if that's the case, he says that the cloud, Ain't a tummy, the tummy, the tummy, the tummy doesn't apply to Ephes, and if you have a tummy, the tummy together, they have a lot. So then you fall into the issue that the Russian that uses, uh, you know, Falmaps, a Russian like that. We fall into the topic of Zebu Zegorim, and then you pass it accordingly. So the Abnein Ezer says, yeah, we pass in Zebu Zegorim is Mutam. That's what he says. You look in Rab Chaim, Rab Chaim has in his Seifa on the Rambam, in Perigimel and Hilchas Macholos Asuris, he comes to answer a certain kasha of the Rabbit against the Rambam. So he insists that the topic of Zev Zegarim has absolutely no application whatsoever to this issue. Zev Zegarim, Rav Chaim explains, is a topic, a prat within the, the din of Yotzim and Ha'osa. If you have a, a non-kosher animal, it gives off milk. If you have a non-kosher bird, it gives off eggs. So the Bas Hayala grows on the basis of Tome. Or you have a behemoth tray, or you have a cow that's a tray, and you keep on milking it, so the milk that comes from the cow is the Yotzim so if you eat, the Rambam says, if you eat the egg from the oif tummy, or you drink the milk, you don't get malchus. It's not a min tummy. A yotzim in a, a, yotzim in a tummy, tummy is an iser essay. It's not an iser loy essay. There's no love. So Rabbi Chaim says, within the cloud of yotzim in a tummy, what if it's yotzim in a tummy, um in a tohor? It's zed is egore. So that's a makhleg is hatanayim. Rabbi Lezre, we should we pass in muta? A yotzim in a tummy, in a tohor is not called yotzim in a tummy, it's muta. But here, the Medubar of that Vlad, if you have a hybrid between a Tome and a Tahar, and, you, and, and the fact that they can have a lot together doesn't necessarily prove that the, that the other one is Tahar. Let's say it's artificial insemination, so the, the, the medical proof, the scientific proof doesn't apply there. Bisham this cloud doesn't apply. So to say over the years, that is a very good thing. Rab Chaim says, no, it's a mistake. The Vlad is a hybrid, Tome and Tahar together. So Rab Chaim says, the Pashta says that it should be Tome. And an oif tummy or the emit may has not also because it's a yotzim in a tummy. No, it is a tummy. It is on its own a tummy. That's what he, he explains by Rishas in his commentary on the Ram. So he kind of said the whole topic of Zeb Zegorin, in total disagreement with the Chacham Sefer and the and the Avnei uh, Nezer, he says the whole topic of Zeb Zegorin should have no application in such a case where you have a hybrid between a tummy and a toy. This comes up a lot of very often. The artificial insemination between a tummy and a toy by the Amos, and between a tummy and a toy. Uh, by Oifus. Okay, thank you very much. Zev is a garment half of the team that was going to this uh, convention and all, this conference and also uh, are, are being exposed to this, these shilas that we're listening to is our next speaker, and that is uh, Rabbi Dr. Ari Zivotovsky, who will speak about animals and chagodim, present-day issues. of Yemenites, Temanim, and the exception of certain parts of North Africa, the Moroccans. 
Um, I'll go into all the details later on. I just want to call up first before the afternoon. So we have two guests, um, some young guys, uh, Shimon, if you want to come up. Shimon uh, lives now in Lakewood. He, was, uh, he came from Taiman, Yemen, when he was 24 years old. And uh, Shimon remembers eating Chagavim in Taiman. And we have brought some samples of Chagavim. And we'd like to ask him if he can recognize them and identify them as the men that they used to eat in Taiman. So if I could ask the Chagavim to come up and the Shimon to come up. Uh, you'll see a whole presentation. Okay. Okay, um, if the camera could zoom in. Here we have Chagavim. Who's still alive? Wait, we eat not fresh? Um, okay. Um, I'm going to go through later the Simanim given in the Mishnah, but basically the Simanim of the Kosher Chagav are that it has four legs. I don't know if you can see the four legs, I'm holding it by one of the front, there are four legs. There are two jumping legs. The two jumping legs that have knees that go above the body. They have to have wings that cover most of the body. You see these wings are much larger than the body. And the key, the main uh, issue that prevents Ashkenazim from eating them is the issue that we also need a Masora. Shishmo Chagav. We have to know that it was called the Chagav. And that's why, similar to the issue of Biofort, we need, uh, we need a continuous tradition that this is the kind that was eaten. Okay, and um, in Eretz Israel, where there are many Tamanim, some who have come out only in recent years from Yemen, um, but there are many people who have identified different kinds of Chagavim, um, both from Yemen and from Morocco, and this is the type that they identify. In America, we have very few Tamanim. Um, we're lucky that Shimon was able to come up from, uh, from Lakewood. Shimon remembers well eating Chagavim in Yemen, and Shimon, do you... Uh, I don't know if he's in the last year. He said he eat 18, 16 years ago. And then he asked me, and 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 he asked his father and his grandfather, and they said the Shimon that they relied on was if there's a cat, which I'll show you pictures. In the Arba'a, Arba'a, Rebarim, it's a question. The boy in the Khed, or in the Arba'a, Rebarim, there's a question. Okay, so again, the Shimon that they used to rely on was a Shimon that's later in the Mishnah, which I'll talk about the history in a minute, but they would look on the body of the Chagav. I don't know if you could see it down there. We'll hold it up later. Okay, I'll show them for the we get a word. Where we go? Um, they would look for a Chet on the bottom. Okay, a Chet on the bottom of the Chagav. Um, what we'd like to do now, we have here a... Um, We'll grill. We're going to grill up the guy. And um, we have, um, I just want to clarify, this is not on the only restaurant. This is not in the only restaurant. This is in a, uh, a hall that's not on the And um, we're going to grill one of them up. And if anybody would like to eat later, we have all of them. Um, Shimon will go and eat in public. Shimon will be glad to eat outside. Okay, if you can see the hat. Okay, uh, you'll see it on the on the PowerPoint in a minute. Okay. Okay. Uh, if any of you want to comment with the Brahma Khagavim is Shahkol. And uh, uh, before they eat it, he's going to show us how they not eat it, how you take it apart. Okay, how does the camera focus and he takes off the shot? The shot. It's not cooked enough. It's not cooked enough. <laughs> When it's well cooked, the head just comes right off. Okay, he pulls off the body, and then he says, "I made it." Okay, great shape. Okay, switch. Okay, 
Thank you very much. Great, thank you. Um, I'm now going to, I'm going to go back, I guess, now that we've had the transfer of the story, we're going to have a little, or go back to the, uh, the beginning of the story. Uh, for sure. A thousand for sure. Okay. A few other animals I just want to mention quickly. Um, one is the yak. Um, very often people are going off to the Far East. People, especially from Israel, go touring in the Far East. They want to know if they can eat yak milk. Yak, I don't know if I'm a so on, but a yak certainly has split hoof and shoes its cud. And another animal that we often hear about, which I think is what Oshachta was referring to, is the Babarusa. The Babarusa is going to be this fabled kosher pig. Um, the Babarusa is definitely not kosher. It does not chew its cud. It does not have a multi chambered stomach. And there's no question the Bob Russo is not a kosher animal. And the last one that I want to talk about in terms of animals before we get back to Chagavim is the giraffe. The giraffe is the source of numerous misconceptions, and it can be used to clarify issues regarding split hoof and short scudder. Okay, these are pictures that we took from the plains of Kenya and in the wild in Ramadan. <laughs> Okay, the first misconception that seems to be well known, when you talk to anybody who has a Jewish education, you ask them, why is there no giraffe meat available in the local butcher shop? And everybody will tell you, because we don't know where to shack it. Um, and this, I just is a copy from a weekly Pasha sheet that's given out in many of the schools in Israel. This is from this year, Pasha's Truma. Why they wrote about giraffe and Pasha's Truma, I'm not sure. But if you look, it says there, the circled area, the giraffe, Kosumanea Tara, giraffe has all of the signs of a kosher animal. Ulechoy mutal ochlom, seemingly it should be permitted to eat it. Ach, hu ne'asar la'akila, it's prohibited. Kevin shesavro, a roch mo'od. Ve'enemi yudim, keitre de'echem b'shkotato. It has a very long neck, and we don't know where or how to shock it. So here's a, a quote from a Jewish action article that I, uh, I once wrote. Um, Every shrita, there are specific anatomic boundaries for a shrita. And it applies to all animals. It should apply to the giraffe as well. For a pigeon, you have a few inches. For a cow, you would have over 12 inches. And for a giraffe, close to six feet. Um, here's just a, a, a copy from the Shokhan you see in, uh, in Yorodea. It tells Malcolm Shrita. In Shrita, what do we have to do? What are the requirements to Shrita? You have to shut the robe of the kana, robe of the windpipe, and the robe of the veshet, the robe of the food pipe of the esophagus. Um, and then the Shogun tells us on each of those simanim where the top is and where the bottom is. And if you take a look, it tells Malcolm Shrita the Tzavar of Akana, it tells us the top and the bottom, and then on the bottom, Hashi, um, the bottom, and then on the left side is Ubeveshet, uh, where it starts and where it ends. All right, if you can bring it up here. For those who are not familiar with what Akana and Aveshet look like, um, we have here Akana and Aveshet, not from a giraffe, unfortunately, but from a cow. This is the Kana, what it looks like. And I guess we can pass it around. You'll see that there are cartilaginous rings that go almost all the way around. And that explains the top part of the Lakam Shrita, where the Shulchan Aruch talks about the complete ring. And for the Veshet, you'll notice that the Veshet is closed up. When you shecht, the Veshet is mitkaveik, it closes up. And that will explain the left side where it talks about the, the signs by a Veshet. And I guess we can pass this around to anybody who wants to. No, but then you can't see them. I don't even need a bag. Okay. Um, so, it seemed though that I was the only one in the world who, who knew that sim in the Shachar. Everybody I talked to says, we don't know where to shak the giraffe. So I asked an OU Kashras expert, one of the meat people, and he told me that anyone who does not know where to shak the giraffe either knows nothing about the law of the Shrita or cannot hit the side of a bar with a big... And that's... Uh, you know, some, Okay, another common misconception, and I apologize, uh, we're having computer problems again, so I can't play the little audio clip, but um, there's a Pasha sheet, or a Halakha sheet, that seems to be given out in many parts of, of the U.S., called Halakha Brewer, and a few months ago they had a sheet dealing with the kosher status of exotic animals, buffalo, uh, buffalo, deer, and giraffe. And when he was talking about giraffe, 
it mentions in there that the Torah tells us that a camel does not have a sliver. And if you look, it says that a camel has a thin pad that it absorbs when he's walking. And then it says, and a giraffe has a thin pad underneath its toes. And therefore, according to Allah Kabura, there's some sort of question, does a giraffe actually have a split hoof? Now, as Rabbi Shach pointed out, one needs to know a basic amount of biology before they pass it about these inyanim. Um, knowing whether a giraffe has a thin pad under its hoof is not something that uh, one could sit in the base magician and determine. One needs to go out and examine. And so, for all of you here, I just want to make sure nobody goes home with the misconception. We have here a giraffe hoof that we cut off a giraffe in the Ramadan Safari. And if you look, you'll be able to pass it around, you'll see it split. But before I pass it around, I just want to, you know, uh, there's a picture of this one, but I just want to clarify some issues with regard to split hook. Um, I received an email about uh, two months ago from somebody in Bolivia. And he wrote, he lives in Bolivia, they have very few Jews, um, it's hard to keep kosher, and he would like to know if the llama is kosher. It's, he writes, it is definitely a cloven hooved animal and chews its cud. So as far as this fellow in Bolivia was concerned, the llama has a split hoof. It clearly chews its cud, and that uh, there's nobody argues. He wants to know, is the llama kosher? Is llama? Here, if we take a look at the llama's foot, you can see that it appears to be a split hoof. If you look at the llama, you look at the top picture or the bottom picture, it clearly looks like a split hoof. However, upon a closer examination, you see that the posterior half, the back half of the llama's hoof, is totally fused. It looks split in the front. In the back, it is clearly not split. It is not split all the way through. How about a camel? A camel, the Torah tells us, is not split. If we look at it again, you take a look. Well, the camel is standing. It looks like it has split off. Who is this from? Is a llama? Then we have a llama. We'll pass that around. You can compare it to the giraffe. Thank you, Rabbi Amikon. Okay, so the camel, according to the Torah, does not have a split off. If you look at the camel standing, it suddenly looks like it's split. However, if we take a closer look, it's clearly not split. The whole bottom is one big pad. It's only in the very anterior portion that it looks split. I'm not sure we have time to go into this. Okay, a pig, according to the Torah, has a split off, and indeed the pig's off is fully split. A red deer is similar to other kinds of deer, and again, its hoof is fully split. How about the giraffe? There's no question that the giraffe hoof was fully split, despite what the halacha brewer wrote. So I'd like to pass around the, uh, the giraffe hoof and the llama hoof. There you go. Okay, I'll pass this around also. Okay, the, um, the halacha brewer... Sorry, I have a pig off. Okay. So we have a pig off as well. Okay. Um, the Halakha Brewer sheet talked about this. Talked about another topic. I don't have it over here. I just have an audio clip. But there we have no sound. I'll just tell you what he said. The Halakha Brewer wrote that there's some sort of problem with de-skinning the giraffe. He says it's a very heavy skin. Um, you have to do some sort of de-skinning before Shrita. I'm not sure what he's referring to. But I'll just show you that de-skinning the giraffe. Not really much of a problem once the giraffe is down. And there they were fully de-skinned giraffe. So, okay. Um, the other question regarding the giraffe is the question again that Rabbi Ganak and Rabbi Shachter both addressed, and that's this issue of a Masora. Um, the Chazanish writes that one needs a Masora on animals. Many folks would disagree, in which case we don't have to discuss that topic regarding giraffe. But interestingly, the Halakha Guru wrote, other posts can write that there is a Masora for a giraffe. Why is there a Masora for a giraffe? So he says because the, the uh, Torah and Devarim lift ten kosher animals. One of those ten kosher animals, the Zemer. The Zemer is transmitted by the side of the giraffe, the giraffe. Um, and therefore, he writes that some posts can say that that's a Masora. The fact that Osajigon mentions this is clearly not a Masora, and such claims would never hold up regarding the bird. If I would come to you and say that uh, the Osajigon wrote that it's such and such a bird is kosher, um, is that a Masora? I guarantee you, the OU would not let us eat it based on that Masora. A Masora means ish mi pi ish, one generation to the next. Not that we have a source from a thousand years ago that uses a name. Names are never sufficient for Masora. <laughs> Okay, 
It's a mitzvah to learn the simanim. But the fee that I feel is with a gadish and a messorah, as you tell me, the end on a hook, you know, the crumb of the ish mitzvah, I say, you have the more dinamelo. There's a specific mitzvah to learn the halakhos over and above the mitzvah of Talmud Torah. Not everybody agrees. There's a safer called Amik Yashua by Rabbi Yashua Maman. He writes, after a long discussion of the Chagavim, the Fikum la Neodaiti, Kayom, as a Hamar, this bitter day, the Golas, we've lost pieces of Torah, the Chulayalmen, also the Echlam. There's no question that according to everybody, nobody can eat them. Even someone who comes from Yemen or Morocco, no longer can eat them. He says it's also to even learn the Yom today. And to the Farsim, and he says it's prohibited to spread the word to let people know that there were Jews who ate the government. Obviously, uh, we hold uh, with a Chayim Kaneski on this, not every Shur Maman, so I'm going to continue with the talk of Chagavim. Short talk. Chagavim, as I mentioned, the power of no Shkrit is required. According to the Rambam, they may be eaten alive, although um, all the Nasser Kalim then point out that that's only regarding the issue of uh, Eva Menachai, and there's maybe other Mishurim, such as um, about the Shaks and other things. The Bracha is Shahakal, and the blood, like the blood of fish, is permitted. Um, Jews are not the only ones who ate them. The UN has a website talking about devil locusts. Um, it asks what they're composed of, and it points out 62% of their dry weight is protein, i.e., they're a great source of protein. Um, and if anybody, if, if anybody goes to this website, by the way, the UN then provides recipes for different ways to cook the chagam. Um, here's how they looked when we served them at the dinner that we made in Yishlai two years ago. We were not on the Yashkacha. We serve the Chagavim, and this is how they look prepared by the chef. Okay, the primary sources, first of all, is the Parsha and Shmuli, which lists the, the simonim as well as the, the kinds of permitted ones. And we run through that. Um, the Mishnah in Chulin, which lists the simonim, it says of Chagavim, Kol Sheish Lo Abu Raglayim of Abu Knafayim. It has four legs, four wings, the Karsulayim, the Karsulayim of those jumping legs that I showed. Who knafas chofin at rubo at rubo? The wings cover most of the of the chagav. And again, the kicker of Yosi Omer who shmo chagav, and its name is called the chagav. What? I don't know. You have to ask uh, Ami Cohen who brought those. I don't know those. Okay. And Allah is passing to the shochanah exactly like that. Here is two pictures of chagavim for those who couldn't see it before. Okay, now if you wanted to know if a Chagav was kosher, what sign do you look for? What's a kosher sign? Well, everybody knows the most trustworthy kosher sign that exists in the world today is the... Oh, take a look at the Chagav. You'll see that this Chagav comes with an Oshua. Um, actually, I'm sorry, it's upside down. Okay, there it is. It has, you'll notice the Chet on the Chagav. Um, the Chet was a sign, as I mentioned. Okay, just a schematic. This is what it looks like if you look at the bottom of the Chagav, and later we have another, uh, I think, seven of them over here that aren't yet cooked. You can look at the bottom. You'll see this Chet sign. It looks like the um, Chet over there. It was understood to have different meetings. It would seem to be the Vapashit. Why were they looking for Chet, for Chagav? That wasn't how they understood it. In Yemen, they understood the Chet was for meaning destruction. When Chagavim come through, the destruction is complete. In Morocco, they understood it for Halal, which is Arabic for permitted. It's first mentioned, as I said, in the 13th century in the Yemenite Majesty Midrash Kadol. Um, it was then afterwards widely cited in all the Yemenite uh, swarm and their books. When you interview uh, Yemenites and Moroccans, they all look for their chet. You ask, what could be instead of a chet? Um, here's what another kind of non kosher species look like. You'll notice there's no chet, it's rather more like an X underneath the body. Um, there's a need for Masora, as we mentioned. In Israel, there are many more Moroccans who recently got out. Um, here you see a couple um, with Yemenites. Right. The Yemenites, um, these Yemenites came out about 10 years ago from Yemen. Um, this woman cooked the, the Chagavim for us. That's her husband who was uh, anxiously waiting to eat them. He had not eaten them since they came out of Yemen. Well, it was very interesting. This woman had a half-sister. Her father had two wives. He left Yemen with one wife and some of the children 50 years ago. He left Yemen much more recently. Um, she left Yemen much more recently. The sister remembers eating Chagavim in Yemen. The sister remembers enjoying them. Wait, be careful with those. Don't, don't shake them out. There's one dead one. He's not going to move them no matter how much you shake it. Um, the, um, 
the system, remember, is eating them in Yemen, or Yemen is enjoying it in Yemen. Remember, is actually wanting to eat them as candy in Yemen, but says at this point, there's no way she can bring herself to eat them. It's, it's a cultural thing. The sister who recently came out, on the other hand, was looking forward to cooking them for us and, uh, and eating them. Talking about Masora, in your source, but uh, we're not going to read it now because I see Rabbi Grossman tell him I have to stop. On page 147, Rabbi Chaim Kanievsky discusses from his cultures how we could rely on any Masora, how anybody could rely on any Masora with other Hanavim, because maybe there were people, and we know that we showed them who did not pass them, that you need, like Rabbi Yossi, that you need this Shmo Chagav. So it could be there were people who were passed based on the Simanim. Could be 500 years ago, someone mastered a particular Hagav based on Simanim. How today could we, who require the Shmo Chagav, rely on that Masora? And Ocham Kanievsky rejects that argument, says that if there was a Masora, and he says the same is true by Brod as well, if there was if a Masora, because we don't have to look back to where it came from, or it throws out the whole notion of Masora if you have to look where the Masora came from. So Ocham Kanievsky says that those who rely on Masora, the Yemenites, can rely on it and not worry about it, and he wants to apply the same to Brod as well. Okay, I have to mention in one minute um, the Psach of the Ocham when anybody talks about Chagavim, it always comes up with the Ochaim, Ochaim ben Atal, lives from 1696 to 1743. Most of his life he lived in Morocco. For a short period he lived in Yerushalayim. Um, when he lived in Morocco, early on in his life, he issued a psaq prohibiting the Chagavim that the Jews in Morocco were eating at the time. He later wrote about it both in his parish in Chumash and his parish in Yodaya, the Pritola. Um, it's widely cited um, by everybody because the Ochaim is one of the few Moroccan or Yemenite authorities who is widely known among the Ashkenazi world as well. Page 145 in the source book of the Zorachayim. It had a huge initial impact. I'm not going to go through all the responses now, but what's important for us to keep in mind is that both in his time and after his time, in both Morocco and Yemen, there were numerous responses to, to the Psaq of the Zorachayim. It was not universally accepted. Um, so if we take a look, here's a list of some of the early responses. Um, to the Orachayim, and the father wrote it says that indeed in the Orachayim city it was prohibited. Others in Morocco and in all of Yemen continue to eat it. Um, he has two basic points in the Psaq. One is that the species that was widely eaten in Morocco does not seem to conform to Rashi's description of the kosher Chagav. Rashi describes the kosher Chagav as having the jumping legs. If you remember, there are four legs and two jumping legs. Rashi describes the jumping legs as being closer to the neck than the other four legs. And in the Chagavim going around, you look, the jumping legs are behind. And the second point is the Archaim says, he looked around his town, he could find people with the Masora. Must be it was a newfound uh, Masora, meaning that there was no Masora, and therefore he prohibited it. Um, with the Psaka, of course, much longer, he elaborates on these two points as well as many other minor points. Um, two quick responses. One is that there is no known creature that conforms to Rashi's description. There is no kind of locust or grasshopper or anything that has the jumping legs closer to the neck of the legs. Um, this would seem to be a singular opinion of Rashi. Others don't mention it. And regarding a second point, he did look around the city. He, unfortunately, the Archive did not have email. He wasn't able to find uh, Shachtim and Boiskim and uh, authorities that had him all around. If we search today the literature from the Archive's contemporaries, We'll find there were many contemporary postkim in other parts of Morocco who were indeed permitting it based on Masora. Um, the bottom line, we'll skip to the bottom line of the slide, is that if you want a point by point analysis of the Archaim Psak with a response, um, a recent book came out by Dr. Zohar Amar Chagavim, and in there he has an entire chapter devoted to the Archaim Psak, where he goes line by line. Okay. Um, history of Yudah Chagavim, the wide lean, the UN. It was widely eaten in many parts of Svarad. Uh, there's a, the Rashba talks about it, it was eaten in North Africa, as mentioned by the Archaim. It was eaten in Yemen. It was eaten in the land of Israel. There are Karaites writing in the 11th century, talks about Jews in the land of Israel eating it. Um, and again, in modern times, starting in the 19th century, we have testimony from the land of Israel. Okay. Um, and here's a list in one of the responses to the Archaim from Aaron Paris of Jorba, which is part of Tunisia. He says, I don't know what the Ohio is talking about. I thought the whole world ate it. And I liked it better than all the trees. Okay. And I like it better than all the trees. Okay. History, um, the bottom line is Ashkenazim did not eat it. I'm not going to go through all the sources. 
as Rashi says, um, the last line, the Ain Aliyodim, the Hanukkah Benayam, we're not the king. The Hanukkah Benayam, 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 the Hanukkah Benayam